Hello Java programmers. Let's talk about interfaces and why they are so important and so useful throughout Java programming. A little bit of review. We write object-oriented code. We do object-oriented programming because it allows us to create models of things that exist in the real world or exist in the problem domain that we are addressing. You might have a student record object. You might have a football team object. You might have a video game object. And all of these things exist even conceptually because a student record doesn't exist physically but they do exist in the problem domain that we're addressing and the functionality of object-oriented programming lets us implement all those neat buzzwords that we've talked about encapsulation where data and code move together in the form of a class where we have inheritance, so we have a very general base class. And then as we realize the needs of the problem we're solving of our model, we can create more specific derived classes from that base class. We talk about polymorphism, where we have two things with the same name that might behave differently depending on their context. We have data hiding meaning that when we model something, we don't let anybody directly access the data in that class. We give them functions to call, methods to call, to access that data and validate and protect that information. But one of the problems that early languages face, like C Sharp, and remember C Sharp was a, a predecessor of Java. It was part of the inspiration for Java. C Sharp supported inheritance multiply, meaning you could have more than one base class in a given derived class, which sounds wonderful. Uh, a student might inherit from a person base class and might also inherit from an employee base class or some conceptually correct structure where it makes sense in the real world but we found out pretty quickly that it was problematic to understand it was problematic for the compiler manufacturer to, to implement if you had two methods with the same name in different base classes, which one do you call? How do you refer to the different base classes? In Java, we have the keyword super to refer to the base class from within the derived class, but super only has to worry about one particular base class. What if we had seven base classes or even two? Do we need multiple keywords? And how do we differentiate between those keywords? So the developers of Java decided that multiple inheritance was not a good idea. And we went with the concept of one base class per derived class. And then they imp implemented something called an interface to partially address that lack of capability. And as you study interfaces and as you study inheritance, you should develop an opinion do you think interfaces are any kind of substitute for multiple inheritance? Do you think multiple inheritance is a wonderful thing? Would you rather go back to C++ where you're giving up a lot of the handholding in Java, but you're also capable now of implementing multiple inheritance, multiple base classes for a derived class? So just have that opinion as you're sitting around with your friends eating pizza and watching football, you know, bring that topic up and have a spirited discussion over the benefits and downsides of multiple inheritance. You can never go wrong.
There's an example of what we cannot do. This is a UML diagram, a class diagram. We have a derived class called Nuclear Pizza. And Nuclear Pizza has two base classes. It has pizza as a base class. It has nuclear power plant as a base class. So we can draw this. We can use a UML tool, but it doesn't work in Java. It cannot be implemented as designed. UML gives us a set of tools. It does not tell us the correct way to use those tools. So we can draw a class called Nuclear Pizza, and the communication from this document is, hey, it can have two base classes. However, when you go to implement in Java, you are out of luck. But we might like to do this. We might have a situation, and I'm exaggerating here to make a point, but perhaps there is a nuclear pizza class, and it has all the capabilities and characteristics of pizza, and all the capabilities and characteristics of a nuclear power plant, and we're in love with this design, it absolutely has to be this way. We are just out of luck. However, we can create an, an interface. Note that the notation is different here. It's a dashed line connecting that nuclear pizza class to the nuclear power plant interface. The arrow is still an open arrow. It's not shaded, but the connecting line is a dashed line. In Java, an interface is considered a contract. It's created as its own entity in the project. It's, it's its own file. It's not a class, but it looks a little bit like a class in some ways. And if you inherit from a base class that implements an interface, then you are responsible for taking care of that if you were in the derived class in some situations. One motivation for using interfaces is that we're, we have a base class and it's well understood and we published it. And we know that down the road, developers will be using that base class to create derived classes. We know that's going to happen. We can't predict all of those derived classes, but we know that our base class is going to be popular and it's going to need the functionality provided by derived classes that implement the interface. And this is a kind of a looking into the future type of deal where we know that the base class is going to need to do something, but we don't know what that something is aside from the names of the methods in the interface. And again, if you think this is a good idea, great. I'm not going to give you my opinion either way, but I do want you to look at this from the perspective of an interface possibly being some kind of adjunct to multiple inheritance. Here's the bottom line then. If you've got a base class, that claims to implement an interface but doesn't do it, and I'm simplifying this dramatically, but you have a base class that references an interface, then if you inherit from that base class, it's your responsibility to implement that interface. That's the way we want things to work. Just to clarify some terminology then, we've talked about the concept of a method signature this came into play when we discussed polymorphism. The method signature is two things and only two things, the method name and the argument list. When we say argument list, we mean the type and order of those parameters. I don't care what their names are. Names don't mean anything, but the type and order of those parameters. And I am going to change this because this isn't quite right. That should say parameter. 
The parameter is what appears in the method signature. The argument is what is passed when the method is invoked. So there's a difference between those two terms. These are method signatures. There's no scope. There's no return type. There's no code. There's no curly braces. This is the syntactical derivation of the method signature. So when you look at a method, whether it's in an interface where all you see is the signature or whether it's the method itself as it's implemented, always notice that signature. Okay, so we're going to look at an example where we're creating a pure abstract class. We've talked about abstract classes before. They, the keyword abstract means that they cannot be instantiated, which is great. But in this class, it's declared as abstract and it is also declared to implement an interface. Now you'll notice in the code there is nothing. Therefore, it cannot possibly be implementing that interface. <laughs> but because of the way we wrote this abstract class, if you inherit from it and you are not abstract, you will have to implement that interface. So the abstract class is leaving it up to you to take care of that problem. Here's what the interface might look like. All we have here is a signature and a semicolon. The parameter list in this case is empty. There is a return type, but remember that's not part of the signature. So in order to differentiate that build function from other build functions, it would have to have a different parameter list. Go back to the previous slide, refer to the implements keyword in the definition of that abstract class. If you, if you inherit from that base class, then you are required to implement that interface unless you yourself are also abstract, which could be, but we're not going to look at that example. So we'll say as a rule, if you inherit from this base class called base class, you have to implement that interface, whatever it is. So it'd be your responsibility to look at the interface definition, open it up in Eclipse, just like you would any class file and see what the signature is and then make sure that you provide that. Of course, now going on behind the scenes, please don't forget there's all kinds of design work that should have already been done. So you should already know what this build method should do. And you should already know the purpose of that base class as well as the purpose of any classes you're deriving. There's an example implemented in Eclipse. Now in this case, we have alumni, main, person, and student, four Java classes. And you can tell by the name of one of those classes, main.java, that that's where our main method is. But the class hierarchy in which we are interested is student, person, and alumni. And then we have open the interface the interface is called work. Also notice in the project explorer that work shows up, but the icon is a little bit different. It doesn't look quite like a class icon, which is telling you it's an interface. I have provided a skeleton of this project for you on Canvas. So you can go grab that and import it into Eclipse and then follow along with me as we talk about this example. I'll give you a moment to do that. Okay. Hopefully you stopped the video and you inher inherited. Imported the project. Make sure you unzipped it first and it should be in your Eclipse Project Explorer just like mine is. 
so we have a base class called person and it is abstract and then we have a derived class called student that inherits from person and we have a derived class called alumni that also inherits from person we don't have the interface yet referring back to the slide again we need to create an interface called work it can be in the same package let's do that now we haven't created an interface before in this class so we can right click on the package and say new interface it's not a class anymore the interface should be called work capital W if we try it with a lowercase w Eclipse is unhappy because by convention not by rule but by convention most Java programmers capitalize the first letter of an interface name and we'll just drop it in there in this example I'm omitting Java Docs and comments just so you can see me get through this without watching me type a lot of things but you would be expected to document all of these things appropriately remember our rule is we Java Doc classes we Java Doc methods we don't Java Doc the main class or the main method everybody knows what those are but now we're going to add another rule we will Java Doc interfaces and this is even more important because an interface can be a little bit vague since it could apply across multiple classes therefore it is important to explain what this interface is and how to use it and also Java doc the methods inside the interface even though they won't have any code sounds a little bit weird you might have to write a very general description of that interface but I mean of that method in the interface but it still needs to be there we have our interface now we have our abstract base class and now let's tell the abstract base class that it implements the interface implements work no problem no errors no runs no hits we don't have to do anything else since this is an abstract class we're good to go let's go look at the student class now remember that the student class inherits from that person class and that looks fine too so far but watch what happens when I hit save all when I hit save all Eclipse double checks to make sure that everything I am inheriting from is not putting any unexpected burdens on me is there anything I else I need to know about in order to build this project well if you look back at the person class the person class promises to implement this interface and Eclipse says okay is that derived class student implementing the interface because the derived class is inheriting from person so whatever person commits us to we have to follow through on so far so good because there's nothing in the work interface so yeah from a strict strict technical perspective student is implementing the interface because there's nothing to do in there look back at the slide however and things are going to get worse because in that interface is a method called do work and when we add that to the interface we're going to break this project 
and that's what I'm going to do right now. Do work. Forgot to put void in front of it. The interface is fine. The interface says now that whoever implements me must provide this method. And that's part of the Java architecture now. Okay, well, who implements the interface? Well, look back at the person class. Person class is promising that I'll do it, I'll do it. However, the person class is abstract, so he gets a free pass. He doesn't have to do it. However, the poor student class now has a problem because he is inheriting from person. Person promised to implement that interface. Person passed the buck because person is abstract. Now it falls upon student to do that. So we have an error. This is a fatal build error. This is not a warning. And Eclipse says the type student must implement the inherited abstract method work dot do work. It's a pretty good error message if you take the time to read it. Because we know what inherited means. We know what abstract means. Eclipse offers to fix it for us. The first fix is add unimplemented methods, which we're going to take in a minute. The second fix is a disaster. Just make student abstract, and then it's passing the buck. It doesn't have to implement the interface because it's abstract, which is not what we want in this case. We want the first fix. And this is a legitimate uh, solution for you. So if Eclipse offers to add unimplemented methods to fulfill the interface committed to by the base class, you can do that. You just have to go in and add your own code as necessary here. This solves the syntax problem, the build problem. It does not fix any logic problems, though, because you've still got an empty method here. And when you hit save, that should make that error go away. Now student is correct. Student will build. Alumni is still broken. See the little error flag on the alumni tab there where the file is open. Need to do the same thing here. Add unimplemented methods. And I usually take out the to do. So now we have solved our build problems. Save all makes the little error go away. But we should write some code here and demonstrate how all this fits together. I'm going to put a print statement in each of these implementations of the method so we have some output. to allow us to differentiate between the two methods. I am a, I am an alumni. And I do work. How about that? And I'll do the same thing in the student class. I am a student. And I do work. How about if we say homework here? Students do work. Alumni do work. But we haven't called these methods yet. We will in a second. Now let's go back to our main. Let's put some code in here. Student s equal new student. Declare and instantiate a student object. Alumni A equals new student. Oops, alumni. Alumni. I have two terrible variable names, but for the purpose of illustration, they're fine. 
and I can call the methods now. I can say s dot do work. And I can say a dot do work. Not a problem. I can run that. I get output. Everything's great. You can see in the console window it called the different methods depending on the type of object that invoke the method. Okay, so far so good. Nothing really exciting now. But let's illustrate a concept called programming to the interface. This concept is something that a lot of programmers and a lot of libraries that we use depend on heavily. And if you don't know what it means to program to the interface and if you don't look for opportunities to use this, you're going to be coming up short. It matters. The first thing I'm going to do is in this main class just create another method public, static, void, uh, I, let's see, what's a good name for this? Let's do work, how about that? Let's do work. Now, in this, in this method, we're going to send a parameter and we'll call that parameter. Now watch, here's where things get really good. Work, worker. Take a close look at that parameter. Notice the parameter is not a class type. It is an interface type. I'm going to say that again. The parameter that this method requires is not a class type. It's not a student or a person or an alumni or an integer or a float or a double. It is an interface type. That means we can pass anything to this method that implements that interface. And the method doesn't care. As long as what it gets implements the interface, it's fat, dumb, and happy. Let's Java doc that because it is so interesting. The worker parameter is any object of a type that implements the work interface. Doesn't matter what it is. Might not even exist today. I might write it in 10 years. Right now I know I have two of those. I have student objects and alumni objects that implement that interface. Tomorrow there could be a third kind of object. There could be a grad student or a faculty or just a member of the community. We all do work. But this method will deal with any parameter that implements that interface. So all we have to do is call it let's, whoops, Let's do work and pass it S. And then let's do work and pass it A. I'm going to comment out lines 9 and 10 because we don't need extra output. And then inside the method, get ready. Here's where it gets amazing. Worker dot ready. Do work. Look at that. Invoke the method defined by the interface. This is programming to the interface. So I wrote a method that can call that can call other methods defined in some interface. I don't care what class implemented that interface. I don't care if that class even exists today. Whenever it does exist, this method will work correctly. The next thing we'll do is look at a very popular application of programming to the interface.
and that is in slide 15 the comparable interface so we have a scenario where as programmers we have data and we often need to sort that data we could come up with a list of things we could store it in an array list or some other kind of collection that we don't know about yet and sometimes we need to alphabetize or sort by year or month of the year or day of the month or middle initial or who knows what I mean an array list could contain any kind of objects well when it comes time to sort we have two choices we can shut everything down and go write a sort we can look at Wikipedia and find a sort algorithm we can implement that algorithm and then test it and see if it's efficient if it does what we need debug it or we can look for a built-in sort method in the language that we're using and the Java library is extensive most modern languages today provide sorting routines as built-in opportunities so it's unlikely that your employer will ask you to write a sort but it is likely that your employer will expect you to know how to go find a sort that's built in to whatever environment you're using and then use that sort and that's where the comparable interface comes in as you're following along with me hopefully you realize that since it's an interface then any class that implements this interface can be sorted and I'll say that again because it's so cool any class that implements this interface can be sorted we have a built-in sort and it's programmed by somebody somewhere around the world don't know who don't know when and we don't even know how at this point we don't know what sort of we don't know what sort algorithm they used we do know however that if we implement this interface then their sort algorithm can sort our data programming to the interface if you look at the comparable interface it has one method in it it's a very easy interface to learn the method is called compare to it takes one parameter and that is something you're comparing the other parameter would be the this object since you're putting this method into a class there's always a this pointer to refer to the current object therefore this compare to method takes the current object and this parameter that you've passed in and compares them together well, I shouldn't really say it that way should I I should say that's how you write the method that's not that's how it's supposed to work then it returns an integer value zero means the two objects are the same less than zero means one is greater than the other greater than zero means the opposite and it doesn't really matter whether you return a positive number or a negative number because if the sort order is reversed you just flip that number but it's an easy to do and I have an example for you for us to talk about slide 17 has a snapshot of the project it's available to you in canvas please download it unzip it import it into Eclipse at this time and we'll talk about it remember this is a uh, programming to the interface and in this case the interface is a well-known well understood interface that's published as part of the Java library I'm going to go back to slide 15 while you're imp importing that project into Eclipse and I'm just going to grab that URL and browse over to it it says all known implementing classes so you can see there are 
numerous Java library classes that can be sorted because they've already implemented this interface. And we want to make us, we want to make our work part of this compendium of classes. So take some time to read this. It's very simple. It's just got the one method in it. This is probably the easiest interface you'll ever, ever implement after the one I showed you a couple minutes ago. All you have to do is return a negative integer, a zero, or a positive integer. Again, don't be, don't be uh, intimidated by that. It's very easy. If you're returning the wrong positive or negative value, just flip it, and that will change the sort order. You don't have to put a lot of thought into it. Now, I assume that you've implemented that by now. I'm sorry, imported it by now. I have it here in my project explorer. I have main.java open. And it looks pretty much like the slide does. I think there's a couple extra lines of code here. But let's look at vehicle first, because that's the class that's going to sort or be sorted, sorry. The class vehicle implements the comparable interface. Now this is a parameterized interface, meaning that you have to tell it what kind of class that you're implementing when you implement the interface. So you can see it looks somewhat like an array list in the delimiters in the less than, greater than, which look like an HTML tag, we have the word vehicle, meaning that this interface implementation will handle vehicle objects. And then down below, there's compare to. There's the implementation of that interface. We are naming the parameter as V because it's a vehicle object. If you look back at the website, the compare to method uses an O, which is generic for just an object, and then T is generic for type, some data type, some class. And it has to be that way because at the time this was written, they didn't know what would be used to implement this interface. They didn't know there would be vehicles and all kinds of other things that would want to be compared. Therefore, they just use placeholders like T and O. In our code, however, we know it's a vehicle, so we name it uh, V and we use the vehicle class. Now, this vehicle class is not complicated at all. It has a name of the vehicle like bicycle or car, and it has a number of wheels. Bicycles have two wheels, cars have four wheels, airplanes, jets, whatever, have no wheels except when they land, which we don't care about. And it has a constructor where you can initialize the name of the vehicle and the number of wheels it has. And it has getters. There are no setters here. They were unnecessary. You can initialize the object in the constructor, and once you've initialized it, you're stuck with it. You can't change the values just for convenience of the example. Therefore, it's not a good model for anything. We wouldn't use this model to solve a problem in the real world. It's just to illustrate the concept of an interface. Then there's a two-string at the bottom. But we're going to focus on our compare to. Remember, what it's supposed to do is return 0 if the two vehicle objects are equal. Now, equal is a rough word here, because what defines equality when you're comparing vehicles? OK, that's up to you. That's where the beauty of this interface comes in. If you can define how to compare two vehicles, then the sort algorithm, which you don't even know exists, which you'll never see, can do its job because the sort algorithm is going to be calling your compare to over and over and over and over and over to sort the array list of vehicles. You provide the logic for comparing, 
and Java provides the logic for sorting using your compare logic. I arbitrarily decided we would compare vehicles based on number of wheels for no good reason whatsoever, just we're demonstrating how this works. And if the number of wheels are the same, we return a zero. If we're comparing a car to a car, we just say they're, they're the same, they're equal. If the number of wheels on the current object is less than the number of wheels on the parameter passed to the method, then I say uh, I return a positive one and otherwise I return a negative one. And I see a bug here in my, not a bug, but I see a style issue already that I did not use curly braces, did I? So this is my code and I take responsibility for it and I should have done that. There you go. That's my compare. If I come back tomorrow, realizing that the comparison is backwards, all I have to do is flip this from a less than to a greater than. That will sort them in reverse order. I'll leave it the way it was. Doesn't matter, but I'll leave it the way it was. Also, I put in a print statement. That allows you to see how many times this method gets called during the sort process. Sorting is computationally expensive. There are sort algorithms that optimize time. There are sort algorithms that optimize space. You can't have it both ways, but there are some kinds of data that sort best with one sorting algorithm and other kinds of data that sort best with another sorting algorithm. Beyond the scope of this class, that's a computer science issue. However, for our purposes, since we are not computer scientists, we are going to call collections.sort. That's all we have to do. Pass it the array list of vehicles and it will do the sorting. That's all we have to do. In my array list, I have created a whole bunch of vehicles. So I have something to sort and they go from a rocket that has zero wheels, a kite has zero wheels, a unicycle has one wheel. And notice they are in ascending order by intent. So the first thing I put in was a rocket with zero wheels. The second thing I added was a kite with zero wheels and so on up to a 19 wheeler, which is bigger than an 18 wheeler, which night with has 19 wheels. All right. Now I don't know. Let's say I don't know. I don't know whether it's going to sort in ascending or descending order. Let's say I'm not sure, I'm confused by how to implement this compare. So I will simply run this and see what I get. There's my output. Notice the whole bunch of comparisons that took place. All those comparisons took place. That's the print statement in the compare to method. When it finally finished, it sorted in descending order. So 19 wheeler appeared at the top, followed by truck, followed by Corvette. We essentially, or precisely, reverse the order of the elements in the array list. Let's add one more element just to prove that it actually does work. And let's add something that has zero wheels. Let's add a hoverboard with zero wheels. Notice the order now. We have rocket, the first thing that went into the array list with zero wheels. We have hoverboard, the last thing in the array list with zero wheels. They're definitely out of order. They're not ascending or descending right now. When we run this again, there's rocket and hoverboard and kite 
all the way at the bottom with zero wheels. 19 wheeler being at the top. You can see that it is so easy to simply call the method called sort after you've implemented the compare to. Now, how does this relate to programming to the interface? Well, the compare, the sort method right here, the sort method will take any data type as an argument that implemented the compare to method. The sort method in the collections class will take any argument of a type that implemented the compare to method. And since we did implement compare to in the vehicle class, sort is happy to deal with that. There is a vehicle. Back to the vehicle tab. It implements the compare interface. I kept calling it compare to. I'm sorry, it's the comparable interface. And the method is the compare to method. And someday someone will say to you, have you ever used the comparable interface? And your answer now is yes. And you know the comparable interface consists of one method, which is called compare to. Implementing that interface allows you to call collections.sort to sort anything that implements that interface. This presentation has demonstrated the value of learning how to use and implement interfaces and also the value of the concept of programming to the interface. Thank you.